make mention, if you don't know, we do have podcasting available off the website. There's about, we think now about 175 or 180 messages posted on, on our website. You can go through studies for the whole books of the Bible, all the study notes are there, and just uh, great, uh, great resource for you, all free. So uh, just uh, to remind you of that. And uh, once you turn, if you have a Bible, to Matthew 28, we're going to look at a message entitled The, uh, the Empty Tomb. And, um, of course, uh, diverting from our normal uh, book, verse-by-verse study in uh, the book of Revelation this morning, so that we might focus our attention on the, the resurrection. And uh, as you do that, why don't we have a word of prayer. Father, we do just rejoice. We thank you for the worship that the, the ladies and the girls were able to do through the hula to give you praise and, and honor. We just uh, want to rejoice in your resurrection, the facts of your resurrection, and what it means to us uh, as believers, Lord. So as we recount the story of the women going to the tomb, Lord, we pray that uh, the principles and things that we see there would be, many would be applicable to our, our lives this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a uh, uh, story, that, a true story, but kind of a, a fun one of uh, uh, a dad and his eight-year-old son driving uh, a familiar route to them past a cemetery, uh, and apparently they'd done it many times, but as he recounts the story, that particular morning, uh, they were preparing for a burial the next day. So you've probably seen that site where it's, uh, that area is dug out, there's a, a fresh pile of dirt uh, next to it and so forth. And apparently this little guy had never seen that before. So in passing, he was watching, he noticed and he exclaimed to his dad very loudly, look dad, one got away. <laughs> so he, apparently he believed in the resurrection. There was also a, uh, the Health and Human Services Department at Greenville County, South Carolina believes in the resurrection. They sent out the following letter to someone who had passed away recently. They said, your, uh, quote, your food stamps will be stopped effective March 1992 because we received notice that you passed away. May God bless you. You may reapply if your circumstances change. <laughs> so, you can make comments about bureaucrats there, but apparently they believed in the, in the resurrection uh, as well. On a more serious note, an uh, uh, article from uh, Decision Magazine a number of years ago, one writer uh, brings the seriousness of this idea of death and resurrection. He says, we hate and fear death and do anything to po postpone it even for a little while. But if we were unable to die, it would be worse. The blind would remain blind. The retarded child would never have a normal mind. The injustices of this world would continue to prevail. Those terminally ill would remain ill but never terminate. And aching hearts would continue to ache and never be healed. But the promise of God is that we die, yet we're not dead. If Jesus lives in us, we will have changed lives and live eternally. And uh, that is the promise of the resurrection. Again, Matthew's gospel, he's been laying out uh, for us the understanding that Jesus is the king. He is the Messiah. He is the coming king that was uh, being awaited for. And, uh, and of course, the culmination of that claim and those promises are actually uh, the resurrection. So the first thing we notice that it's uh, women who first returned to the tomb. Verse 1, after the, the Sabbath or the Shabbat, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene uh, and the other Mary went to, the, uh, to look at the tomb. So uh, we know that the women uh, returned. They're identified as eyewitnesses. And just a, a couple of things. One is that the fact that, that uh, it's very interesting that the first witnesses are, are these women. If if the authors of the Bible were more men, were men and not God himself inspiring them, they would have never written this because a woman's testimony in that day wasn't worth anything. It was only because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the teachings of Jesus, who elevated the status of women and children that changed all of that. That was not true here. If man was writing this, he would have made sure the first witness was a man, somebody that, uh, whose testimony would hold up in a court of law. But again, God's word is inspired, uh, and he, we have the truth here. It's these gals that are the first one that goes. Luke identifies them as Mary Magdalene, a Mary mother of James, uh, Joanna, and others. Uh, it's important that they're the first ones from the very fact that they're the ones at the cross. So they saw Jesus die on the cross, 
they went and they saw him buried, and now they go back to that same tomb uh, and they find an empty tomb. Uh, over the years, of course, there's been the critics of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, and, uh, and one of the arguments that they use is the fact that, well, they didn't find him because they went to the wrong tomb. No, these, these gals had already been there before a very dramatic event uh, in their lives, and they returned to the same tomb. Secondly, they return after the Sabbaths, it's plural, and um, uh, you had Saturday, the Sabbath, but then also uh, it's during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, and so they return at uh, Sabbaths, plural. Uh, we know that it's the early in the morning, it's the first day of the week, it's Sunday, that's why we gather on, and on Sunday, is because Jesus rose again from the dead. So every Sunday we gather, we're gathering to celebrate the resurrection of, uh, of Jesus Christ. It was in the Passover Seder, if you were here with this, you remember there's a point, the, kind of the, the culmination of that whole dinner where there's a, a, a bag, a linen bag that has three compartments in it, three matzahs, three pe pieces of bread uh, that uh, to the Jews today, when they go through it, they don't really understand what that, that trinity represents. Why are there three? And they have different theories, but I think we understand that it represents the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in fact, it's the middle one uh, that is pulled out of that bag at a point. It's broken in two. And uh, we first note that it's pierced, that it's striped. It's broken in two. Half of it is wrapped in linen. It's put away for a period of time. It has to be redeemed back again, all representing Jesus Christ and his body that was pierced, uh, that was striped that was broken, that was wrapped in linen and then brought back because he is our, uh, our redemption and the fulfillment of, of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's why we worship on Sundays uh, Jesus, as he said, is the bread of life. So these women are the first to return to the tomb. Notice it's an angel who reveals the empty tomb in verses 2 to 4. There was a violent earthquake for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. So uh, the angels, again, are the ones that reveal the empty tomb. I, um, I like this angel. He rolls the, rolls the stone back and then sits on it. I mean, why stand when you can sit, you know, waiting for these gals to, to show up? It's been estimated that a three-foot stone that was used to cover the face of, of a cave uh, carved out for uh, for a burial like that, it would take uh, uh, seven to ten guys to be able to move it because it was a chamber was cut in front of it like a channel, and it was rolled slightly downhill. So uh, to get it open, it would have to be again rolled uphill on an incline. Uh, and we've got Roman soldiers guarding it, not just any Roman soldiers. It's like having Navy SEAL team there guarding the thing. They were bound to all fight for the death to guard the Roman seal that was placed on the tomb. Uh, and if that seal was broken uh, and they weren't there to defend it to the death, they'd be killed anyway. Uh, that was uh, what would happen to them. So this idea that these bumbling fishermen from Galilee should somehow get in there and trip through these guys, break the Roman seal, roll the stone uphill without somehow uh, alerting anybody to their attention. Again, one of the other theories of the resurrection that makes no, no sense at all. But it's an angel that's uh, revealing the empty tomb. Notice also that uh, his appearance, quite startling, like lightning. That means his face was like lightning. His clothes were, were white as, uh, as snow. And, uh, and they, again, verse 4, it's the Roman guards. Notice their condition. They're terrified, uh, so afraid that they shook and became like dead men. And uh, uh, remember, it was another set of Roman guards that three days earlier had gone out to oversee the crucifixion. Uh, doing their jobs, professional uh, executioners, as it were, knew what they were doing, uh, and yet they were there, and they watched the events from the cross. They heard Jesus say things like, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Uh, in the end, a victory cry saying, uh, into your hands I commit my spirit. The seven things that, uh, that Jesus says from the cross, given with uh, an earthquake at that time, uh, an eclipse, a total eclipse of the sun in the middle of the, of the day, uh, the Roman soldiers there, these military men said that Jesus was the Son of God, that he was a righteous man, and in the end, they praised and glorified God. I'm just thinking they might have mentioned that to somebody later. You know what I mean? It's, it's not like the regular, uh, how was your afternoon? Good. Now, I'm thinking they might have mentioned that to a few other people. 
including maybe these guys that now have this, this experience uh, out there. Uh, and whether it's the angel that they saw, whether it was Jesus coming from the tomb, whatever it was, uh, they shook like dead men. And again, these aren't, aren't guys out of basic training. Uh, these are hardened, bloodied soldiers that have been there and come back again. Uh, this was not just another day at the office. Uh, and uh, we need to understand the quality of the individual we're talking about here. Uh, the earthquake is described as one as being great or, or violent. Same word is used in uh, Ezekiel to des describe the earthquake in the land of Israel, and what we call a future event, the Magog invasion. Uh, we saw it several times in our study of the book of Revelation. Uh, and when Paul's in prison in Acts 16 in Philippi, and the prison shook, same word that's used. If you visit that prison today, you can still see the crack in the rock uh, in the ground when Paul was released. A violent, uh, tremendous earthquake takes place uh, as well. Uh, but again, I don't know that it was the earthquake that would cause these soldiers to leave their post. I certainly don't think it was a bunch of Galilean fishermen. I think it was an event much larger than that. The fourth thing is the angel who announced, uh, announced that Jesus has risen to the gals is in verse 5 to 7. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the angel encourages the women to, to not be afraid. And why should they not be afraid? Because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead is what he says. Uh, there's a lot of things that can bring fear into our lives today. And uh, if you're not sure about that, watch the evening news. <laughs> it's it's the I don't know why we call it the evening news. It should be the evening bad news, you know, and it's kind of one bad story after another. These people were killed. These people were being beat up. These were robbed. Let's go to the international scene. Here's the war over, and it just goes, it's kind of the bad news. Uh, in our own country, our, the economic troubles, the UN has suggested that they no longer use the U.S. dollar for the standard of value. It's been suggested that uh, uh, we convert to a worldwide currency. Of course, that's something the Bible's always predicted. But uh, uh, again, the man that orchestrated the change of the euro in Europe is now working with the Chinese, considered a, a business genius. And one of the things that they see as necessary from their standpoint and the rest of the, rest of the world is, is to change to a one-world currency. Uh, we've got, uh, we're fighting wars on two fronts. And then we've got our friend in Iran, uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who uh, just uh, yesterday at the idea of that sanctions would do anything to stop him from developing, developing a nuclear weapon said, uh, don't imagine you can stop Iran's progress. The more you reveal your animosity, the more it will increase our people's motivation to double its efforts for construction and progress in Iran. And of course, the development and progress he's talking about are uh, our missiles that he would be able to launch against. He has said on many occasions to try to obliterate Israel. And of course, he has missiles he's tested that can reach uh, parts of Southern Europe now as well. And uh, we could go on and on and talk about his own theology and why he's doing what he's, uh, he's doing, something that's uh, ignored prim in the Western press primarily. But there's enough out there to make us fearful besides our own problems and difficulties. But this angel says, why be afraid? Jesus has risen from the dead. Now, that solves a lot of issues uh, in, in our lives. If we understand that, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, rose from the dead, offers us his grace and his forgiveness and eternal life with him to say, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. It's in John 14 that he told his disciples the night before he died, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Paul said, and uh, again, writing to the church in Philippi, when he thought he may be uh, dying himself while he was in a Roman prison. He says, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies and make them like his glorious body. Uh, there's a lot of things in life that will maybe cause us to fear at times. But it's helpful to remember that Jesus rose from the dead. Now notice uh, Mary's response after seeing the angels city, seated there on the stone, uh, his brilliance, the conversation they have, and so forth. She ran out. She wrote her best-selling book, I Saw Angels at the Tomb, 
Uh, she was on uh, Leno. She was on Ofri. She all the, you didn't see any of those shows. Now, actually, that's not what she did. Uh, just, just checking. It's interesting what she did in her reactions. It's not totally given uh, here in Matthew's gospel. But again, this is quite the experience, and they've had quite the experience. Uh, Jesus, who they believe would be the Messiah, they see him tortured, beaten to a pulp, nailed to a Roman, Roman cross. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, Nicodemus are able to get his body, wrap it in linen, get it in the tomb, seal it. They're there. They know what's going on. Uh, all of the drama, all of the mourning uh, that's going on in, in their own lives, they get there and now the stone's rolled away. You have a supernatural being there uh, speaking to them. Uh, and yet the only thing they're concerned about, as we will see in a moment, is where is Jesus? Uh, it's in John 20, 13. It says, they asked her, woman, why are you crying? She says, they have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put them. Mary was more concerned about find, finding what she believed was the dead corpse of Jesus than having a conversation with this angel or any other spiritual or, or dramatic experience that that morning might have involved. It's like, it's really been good talking to you, and that's a great outfit, like the shiny face. Very good. Very effective here. But will you tell me where Jesus is? Is it just really is what I want to know here? Uh, Mary is actually quite, quite the gal, if you read her background uh, uh, a little bit in the other Gospels. She's doing what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 29, 13. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And that's what Mary was doing here. Again, uh, there's reasons in this world to make us afraid of things at times. But if we understand the resurrection, I think the words of the angel are applicable to us as well. And if we understand Mary's intent and we seek God with all of our hearts, God says, you will find me every time. Every time that you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me uh, every, every time. He wants to be found. He wants to have a relationship uh, with us. Mary understands that. The last thing about these angels, they inform the women that Jesus is not in the tomb, that he's risen. And notice they say, come and see the place where he lay. Uh, in other words, they say, do not take my word for it. Look at the evidence. Look at the evidence. And uh, many times we've said that Christianity is evidential by its very nature, uh, meaning that when we tell people that you should place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you should ask him into your heart and have your sins forgiven and know that you're, you're going to have a life in heaven one day that will be great and be glorious. We say do that because you examine the evidence, you understand the information, not because you've had an emotional experience or somebody could talk you uh, into it, but because of the evidence. This angel, it would be enough to say, I think if I'm the angel, I'd talk in a very big booming voice, special effects, and say, just take my word for it. But he doesn't. He just says, uh, uh, no, come and see for yourself. That's always the invitation of Christianity. Come and examine the evidence. One person who did was Sir Norman Anderson, Cambridge educated, lectured at Princeton, offered a professorship for life at Harvard University. When examining the evidence of the resurrection, came to this conclusion. The empty tomb then forms a veritable rock on which all rationalistic theories of the resurrection dash themselves in vain. He says, I don't know what, what kind of theories you might come up with about Jesus and who he is. What happened on that morning? If you look at the evidence of the fact that this man was crucified on the cross, was dead and verified dead by a professional executioner, and three days later he is seen by many witnesses, seen by them for over a period of 40 days, eventually by a crowd of over 500 people, and then many see him uh, arise uh, into heaven. Uh, he says, uh, uh, those any other kind of rationalistic theories fall very short. I, uh, one of those ideas is the swoon theory. I, I couldn't help but quote Jay Vernon McGee, and maybe you, you have to know Jay Vernon or heard him a few times to appreciate this. But uh, uh, a woman wrote him, and of course he's uh, on the, on the, with the Lord, but on the radio still on a daily basis. But a woman wrote Jay Vernon and, and said, uh, our preacher said that on Easter Jesus just swooned on the cross and that the disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? And McGee replied, Dear sister, beat your preacher with a leather whip for 39 heavy strokes. Nail him to a cross, hang him in the sun for six hours, run a spear through his heart, embalm him, 
put him in an airless tomb for three days and then see what happens. <laughs> he was dead, <laughs> but he rose, rose again. And the angel says, examine the evidence. The angel also promises that they will see Jesus again. He's risen from the dead, is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. So women that are the first to return, uh, the angel is the one that reveals the empty tomb. It's Roman guards that are terrified. Uh, they make the announcement. Notice the disciples now. We had to, get, uh, had to get Peter and John into the story here. It's the disciples who are still waiting to receive the news. We see that in verse 8. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. So after receiving the news, Peter and John run to the tomb, but they run to the tomb in, uh, in unbelief. Now remember, uh, John has been there. He's, he, he watched it all. He was there. He was the only disciple at the crucifixion uh, there with uh, Mary, the, the mother of Jesus, uh, and the other women that are there. Uh, he's, a, he's a young guy. He's, uh, he started following Jesus when he was 17. Uh, he's 20 now. Uh, and then you've got uh, uh, Peter, who we'll mention in a moment. Peter's the older guy. He's the fisherman. Uh, Peter probably looked like a lineman or a linebacker in the, in, in the NFL, as far as church history tells us, and just the sheer strength the guy has as a fisherman on, on one occasion, uh, pulling in a net single-handedly with hundreds of fish in it. And fishermen in, in that area today will tell you that what he did is a very difficult thing to do. Big guy, uh, and it's the, the, these two guys that have uh, grown up together, uh, fished together all of their lives, they're now cowering, both of them. Peter has denied Jesus three times. He's had Jesus before he died in that, in that, uh, the outer area of, the, uh, uh, of one of the palaces of Caiaphas, look him straight in the eye and, and knows that he's already denied him and so forth. And he's feeling uh, probably terrible, very much ashamed. And, and now Jesus is dead and they're hiding behind a locked door uh, in what we refer to as the upper room. But uh, in John 20, verse 3, it says, So Peter and the other disciple, having heard this news, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Appreciates John's humility. Just happened to mention the fact that he got there first. Of course, he's the younger guy, a little more, little more agile. But there, there's, a, there's a purpose in it. But uh, Luke tells us that they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. So they're, they're running in unbelief. They're just going to check it out. Neither one of them thinks uh, this story is going to hold water, but they've got to go find out what's going on. Uh, but after getting to the tomb, they have very different reactions. Uh, again, uh, one is denied Jesus. One stood at the cross and saw him died. Uh, and one arrives first before the other one. And that's recorded in, in John 20, verses 5 to 9. And I, I've got it for you uh, on the screen here. And I want you to notice I've got three times the word saw is underlined, and it's three different words in the Greek. We want to talk about them in a moment. But notice it says, and he, John, they get there, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself, then the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. So three times we have the English word, but it's different each time in the Greek text. Now again, keep in mind the, uh, the tomb of Jesus would have probably been uh, no bigger than the stage. I mean, when, you, when you've got a chisel and a hammer, it's not like how large we'd like this to be. It's, it's a fairly small. It's like it's dug right out of the, uh, out of the rock. Uh, it was for Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, and a very wealthy man. Otherwise, uh, he would not be able to afford to have a tomb like this, one big enough for his whole family, uh, much less right there uh, in Jerusalem. On, uh, as you enter on one side of the tomb, uh, there would have been a, a basically a slab where the, the, the corpse would have been, uh, been uh, laid out. On the other side would have been uh, almost like a storage area because once the body decomposed and it got to just bones, they would actually... Uh, put it in what's called an ossuary or, or a bone box, and they would be stacked up so that eventually the whole family would be uh, buried in there. Uh, it's, again, not a, a big doorway, so he's got to stoop down. John gets there. 
Uh, and the Greek word, when it says he saw, is blepo. It means a casual glance. He's looking in, trying to get the eyes to adjust, looking for the light switch. No, no light switch. Trying to get his eyes to adjust to see what's, uh, what's in there. And it's a casual glance. And then you've got Peter that comes up behind him, and good old Peter barges right past him and just uh, blurts right in, uh, in keeping with his personality. Uh, and then it says, then he's now inside, and he's looking at this stone slab where Jesus had been laying. Uh, and it says that he saw, uh, and that's our word in the Greek, theoreo, which means where we get our English word, to theorize, to theorize. In other words, he's, he's, the wheels are turning, but there's no light going on. I mean, he's just, he's just looking. It's like, what am I seeing here? What is going on? Uh, and then John steps in. And that's the third, and he saw and believed, uh, and that's the Greek term, edo, which means the light went off. John saw something and went, and he believed. And what he saw was this. I used to have this kind of a, a misunderstanding about what were they really looking at. I mean, in an English text, it says, and the linen, and the linen strips were folded uh, on the slab, and then you have, uh, uh, it says, handkerchief that was... Uh, uh, you know, where his head was. But what they were looking at is, uh, is this. Remember, Jesus is, is wrapped in strips of linen. He's embalmed. And I think we all know what an Egyptian mummy looks like. Very similar. So it's uh, uh, it spices and, uh, and so forth and alloys. So what this thing formed around the body was like a cast. Like, well, not like the cast we have today. Everything's Velcro. But uh, in the old days of a cast, when that thing hardened, uh, it was just a shell. Uh, and so that's what they're looking at. They're looking on this slab, and here's like a cocoon, right, of, of where Jesus' body was, but there's no body in it anymore. And then where his head was would have been what would have looked like a turban wrapped around the top of his head. Only thing that would have been exposed was his, was his face. And, there, and, and Peter's looking at it and going, he's theorizing. <laughs> How could this happen, you know, and everything? Uh, John looks at it, and he goes, Jesus rose from the dead. That's the only way you get the body out, out of that thing and out. You know, it just, there's no, no other way. Um, so they both had the same information. Uh, they both had the same, the, the same facts. Uh, uh, Jesus said he would rise from the dead. Uh, the women saw the empty tomb. They have already seen Jesus. They report. These guys go. They see it. It's enough facts, it's enough information for John to believe, but not for Peter. And that's, that's the way it is sometimes. Sometimes pe people need more, more than that. Uh, if everybody basically behaved according to the facts as they understood them, nobody would certainly smoke in this country, right? I mean, it says right on the little thing, uh, smoke these, you're going to die of lung cancer. It's kind of big. Doesn't it say that on, on every one of those things? It's, they kind of keep ramping this thing up, trying to re-educate. And, and those are the facts. People smoke anyway. Because the facts don't matter sometimes. But it mattered to John. It didn't matter uh, to Peter. Uh, in April 2nd, uh, April 2002, well, very well-respected Oxford University philosopher Richard Schweinberg used a broadly accepted probability theory to define the truth of Christ's resurrection. He did it at a very high-profile gathering at Yale University. And to the New York, New York Times writer afterwards, he said, for someone dead for 36 hours to come to life again is, according to the laws of nature, extremely improbable. But if there is a God of the traditional kind, natural laws only operate because he makes them operate. So if God wants to do it. If there's a God and God wants to do it, God, God can do it. And what he did uh, and what he presented at this conference was he used what's called Bain's theorem. In other words, he's assigned values, mathematical values to things like the probability that God is real, Jesus' behavior during his lifetime, the quality of witnesses and their testimony after his death. He plugs them all into an equation uh, and a formula, adds everything up, the results, a 97% probability that the resurrection really happened. That's, that's highly probable. 97%, that's, that's pretty good, I think, from a, a mathematician. We could talk about the great legal mind, Simon Greenleaf, Greenleaf and others who have done all of the study and so forth. But again, for some people, the facts aren't enough. So what happens to Peter? 
Well, Jesus makes a personal appearance. That's what he does. He just shows up to them and has a, a one-on-one conversation with them. And of course, he believes uh, as well. But I think the facts are a step in the right direction. And again, like the angel said, come and examine uh, and make a, make a decision. But still, facts in ascension, a mental ascension to agree. A lot, of, a lot of you today may agree, well, I pretty much believe that. I believe that God sent his son, that he died on the cross, that he rose again. I get all of that. But, but saving faith is now you put your faith and your trust in that. It's really two different things. Uh, but understanding the facts and the information certainly is a beginning. Part of the problem is that we're blinded to the truth sometimes. Paul addresses that in 2 Corinthians 4.3. He says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Paul says that th- there, is a, there is an enemy of God out there, Satan, and he can apparently spiritually blind people to keep them from understanding, seeing the truth, and the necessity of entering into a relationship with God while there's still the opportunity. Uh, John does at this point. Peter doesn't. But the Lord in his graciousness appears to him. Now, the other thing that's mentioned in one of, the, uh, one of the other gospel accounts is that part of the problem is it says that and Peter did not understand the scriptures. Now, we could talk about all the different scriptures that, that talk about the Messiah, his nece- the necessity for him to die and rise again. But uh, maybe the one that got to him is the one that he used the very first time he ever preached a sermon, which is in Acts 2. Obviously, it meant a lot to him. Because uh, he used it there uh, when he spoke to about uh, uh, several thousand people. And, and what he said led 3,000 of them on the spot to make a decision but the, to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And it's Psalm 16. David there is writing. David says, I, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will, not let, uh, you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see decay. Holy One, again, capitalized, another term for the Messiah, for Jesus. You have made known to me the path of life. You have filled me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. David is saying that, that one day the Messiah is going to come. And the Messiah is actually going to die, and he's going to rise again. Because you won't let his body see decay. When does the body begin to decay scientifically? Fourth day. What a coincidence that uh, Jesus, again, according to David, predicting, said the Messiah must die and rise again, and he's got to do it before the fourth day. And he says, that's how I know I'll, I'll never perish either, that I will rise again uh, with him. Uh, that's what Peter came to understand. That's the scripture that he uses when he first preaches his, uh, very, uh, his very first sermon. It's interesting, it's only recently that rabbis in Israel have begun to admit that the Messiah needs to resurrect from the dead in accordance with Psalm 16. Again, they, for the most part, not, not all, but for the most part, they've missed the Messiah's first coming. They, they're still waiting for him, but even they admit that he must rise from the dead. So again, uh, an empty tomb proves nothing to us Unless the body can be produced by the critics and say, nope, he's still dead, there he is, which they were unable to do in the first century, Uh, it still means nothing to us unless we have eyewitness accounts of his resurrection uh, and we have those. So what does it mean to to, to me and you? Well, borrowing from some of my reading from Warren Wordsby, he says it proves that Jesus is God's son. Jesus stated on many occasions he has the ability to lay his life down and to pick it up again. He said, no one takes my life from me. I give it freely. Uh, It verifies all of the truth claims that Jesus made. Secondly, it verifies scripture because the Old Testament and the teachings of Jesus proclaim the Messiah would come and die and rise again. If he doesn't do that, then it's not true. So it supports the idea of the truth of scripture. It assures us of our own future resurrection because Jesus died and rose again we will one day be raised to life like him. In fact, the whole structure of Christianity is based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ from from the dead. The Apostle Paul says, if Jesus is not risen from the dead, 
we're still in our sins, and we're to be more pitied than all men. But of course, he goes on to expound upon the, the resurrection of Jesus. Fourth, it's a proof of a future judgment. Now, Paul, as far as we know, the only recorded sermon we've got when he's not preaching uh, uh, directly in a synagogue or in a religious setting, uh, he's uh, speaking to, to a bunch of intellectuals up on uh, Mars Hill, what we call the Areagopius area in Greece. Uh, he says this in Acts 17. He says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. Well, what ignorance would that be? Paganism, idolatry, denial of God's existence, and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. Although there weren't too many atheists in the ancient world. They all, had, they all believed in some kind of God, some way. And he says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. That pretty much covers it, huh? All people everywhere. Uh, what does it mean to repent, to change our mind? Uh, God overlooked such ignorance in the past, but now he commands, it's not a suggestion, he commands that all people change their thinking and they repent, again, to change my mind. Who God is, his nature, who I am and my nature, the fact that I need to be, to be saved from my sins. I'm, I'm not perfect. If, if, if that you're still questioning that, just just check with a good friend, or if you're married, check with your spouse. Honey, do you really think I'm perfect because I'm kind of still thinking I am? And you can really get that issue settled pretty quickly. Uh, we're not, and therefore, there's things that we need to be forgiven of. That's what God says, and when we repent, we go, mm, I think I've kind of been wrong about this before. I think I agree with God now. That, that's, that's repentance. He commands all people everywhere to repent, and the reason he does this, Paul says, is for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. Why should we believe this? <clears throat> because he's risen from the dead by raising him from the dead. The resurrection is proof, the fact, Paul says, that, that everybody pretty much ought to get it in terms of who God is, our nature, the need to be forgiven, and God's remedy for our, our situation. Uh, it's the proof of the resurrection. The fifth thing in terms of what this means for us, it's the basis for Christ's heavenly priesthood. Uh, it's um, uh, Hebrews 7.25 that says that uh, he is able to save completely those who come to God to him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus is at the, uh, the right hand of God the Father praying, making intercession for, for you and I. Didn't know anybody was praying for you, but Jesus has been praying for you, and that's a, that's a very good thing. Jesus, who lived a human life, understands everything you're going through or are going to go through, tempted in, in every way, uh, knows what it is to be, to be maligned, to be abandoned, knows what it is to be betrayed, knows what it is to, to be loved as well, but experienced all the things that we experience, all the same temptations, he understands. He is the perfect mediator between God and, uh, and, and man. It also gives us the resurrection power for Christian living because we really can't live Christianity in our, in our own strength. And, and that's a misunderstanding. I know I misunderstood it growing in a church for years. I thought somehow you, uh, you kind of went forward at some kind of church service. You said a, a simple prayer asking Jesus uh, into your heart, and then you better get together after that, boy, because they're watching you now. <laughs> and I just thought, I could never really quite get it together, so I, I, had a, I just didn't really get it. But uh, the idea is that not only does he forgive us, but he gives us his Holy Spirit who begins to change and who begins to transform really who we are to make us who we really probably wanted to be all, all, all along. John Stott, uh, great... Uh, uh, British theologian uh, in his uh, book, Basic Christianity, says, it's no good giving me a play like Hamlet or King Lear and telling me to write a play like that. Shakespeare could do it. I can't. And it's no good showing me a life like the life of Jesus and then telling me to live that life. Jesus could do it. I can't. But if the genius of Shakespeare could come and live in me, then I could write plays like that. And if the spirit of Jesus could come and live in me, then I could live a life like that. To have him as our example is not enough. We need him as a savior. It's, it's not enough just to look at the guy's life and go, awesome, I'd like to be like that. You're not going to be able to do it unless 
again, that surrender the life to him. His spirit lives within you. Internally, he begins to change you. The seventh thing, it assures us of our future inheritance. And that's why we certainly celebrate uh, this morning, uh, because we have a, a living hope. It's been said that a dead hope grows weaker and weaker and eventually dies. I don't know if you've ever hoped something would happen. Maybe you're hoping your retirement account would come back again or something. You know, there's a lot of things that we hope for in life that, that we're disappointed over. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and then when it, when it doesn't happen and we kind of keep waiting, that hope begins to dwindle and dwindle and dwindle. And it's, it's really a dying hope. That, that's not what Christianity is. Peter, Peter put it this way in 1 Peter 1, 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again into, again, what kind of a hope? A living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in, in the last time. Ours is a living hope. That means it's getting better and better, and it's getting brighter and brighter, and we're getting uh, closer and, uh, and closer to be with the Lord and to be in heaven for all eternity each and every day that we, uh, we live. It's not a hope that's dying out. It's a, uh, it's a living hope. So the resurrection is the, the cornerstone of our, uh, of our faith and who we are as, as people, as, as followers and believers in Jesus Christ and it should mean all of those things to us uh, each and every time that we think about the Lord. Uh, and it's uh, a good thing that this time of year we consider once again uh, the price that was paid for our sins, uh, who Jesus is, uh, the truth of his words, and all, again, verified by his resurrection from the dead. And the way that you come into a relationship with the Lord, or maybe if you've been away from the Lord for a while, is simply just to come back and acknowledge uh, your, your own sin, that you want to be forgiven. You want to have that re, uh, relationship. It's not a difficult thing. It's not a class to take. It's not a school to go to. Uh, it's not 10 rules you keep for 10 days. It's, uh, it's not uh, any of those things. Uh, Paul put it this way very simply in Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart. God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And that's the bottom line. I mean, to place your faith in Jesus Christ, to be forgiven of your sins, to have eternal life, so that one day when you stand before the Lord, and you will stand before the Lord, you will not be put to shame. But instead, you'll be warmly embraced by, by a loving Savior. Father, together, Father, lift up your name. Call on our Savior, fall on His grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering. As your saints bow down, as your people sing, we will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God.
that my Redeemer is.
Every new revolution, every beautiful vision, every sweet note sung begins a new creation of soul. So spiritual. Bring me nothing to a fountain of ocean, fill me an ocean of new horizon, fire flames of true devotion to soul. So spiritual. Every new revolution. Every new revolution. Every beautiful vision. Every sweet love song becomes a new creation of soul. So spiritual. Devotion, so, so spiritual. 